It's one of the oldest unsolved murders in American history. On the evening of October 21st, 1974. Tonight on News at 11, celebrated writer of urban fiction Donald Goins was found dead in his Detroit home. According to homicide detectives, there was a deadly double murder this evening, and one of the victims was prolific writer and storyteller Donald Goins, along with his common law wife who was also brutally murdered. Detectives have no leads at this time. The death of Donald Goins still has his adoring fans shocked and bewildered. It remains one of the biggest cold cases of all time. The celebrated and prolific writer of street culture told grisly stories with graphic details of underworld politics within the ghettos of America. His novels gave readers more than just a glimpse but a full view of what life was like for the forgotten in society. With 16 books to his name and two that were made into movies, Donald Goins was definitely considered an accomplished and successful writer. Based in the communities that served as a backdrop to most of his stories, Donald was always a heartbeat away from the real action. And some would say he was the heartbeat of the action. Art imitating life and life imitating art. His death may not ever get solved, but new information might get us closer than we've ever gotten before. On this episode of Hollywood Memoirs, we discuss the life of one of the most successful writers of urban fiction, Donald Goins. Detroit, Michigan, former home of the big three car manufacturers in America, General Motors, Ford Motor Company, and Chrysler. It was also the birthplace of legendary record label Motown Records. Some of the biggest artists in entertainment came through Motown. Michael Jackson and the Jackson Five, Marvin Gaye, Stevie Wonder, The Temptations, Diana Ross, and The Supremes. There's a lot of cultural history in Detroit, some good, some bad. 1936, the decade of the Great Depression, proved to very challenging to most of the country. While the economy was showing signs of improvement, and many Americans were still trying to recover, that same year, Donald was born into a middle-class family who owned and operated a laundry business. He was the middle child of three, and the only boy to parents Joseph and Myrtle who imposed a strict Catholic upbringing. In the Goins household, Donald wasn't allowed much freedom to run the streets. Gang activity was very pervasive and active in Detroit. Donald's father, Joseph, was so protective of his only son he built a rec room on the top floor of the laundromat equipped with a pool table and record player to keep Donald and his friends entertained without needing to venture off into the world. Donald's parents wanted him to finish school and run the family laundromat, but Donald had plans of his own. He wanted no parts of the laundry business. He was more attracted to the fast life of the streets, pimps, prostitutes, gamblers and thieves. These were the people who caught his attention. These were the people he wanted to be like. Donald knew the only way he could enjoy the life he most admired was to leave his parents' house, which wouldn't be easy. The senior Goins was a strict disciplinarian. Father and son argued relentlessly. Donald became rebellious and unruly. Almost every night he either came home drunk or high, but never sober. At 15, Donald's mind was made up. He felt he was a grown man, and he didn't need to take orders from his father again. It was 1951. The Korean War was just beginning, and America needed soldiers. Donald wasn't old enough to enlist, uh, but that didn't stop him. He dropped out of high school, got a fake ID, lied about his age to the recruiter, and joined the Air Force. This was the start of new adventures for Donald. As a serviceman, he traveled to different parts of the world, experiencing cultures he never knew existed. But also, he now had a $100 a day heroin addiction that ruled his life, and he couldn't kick it. Although Donald had an honorable discharge from the Air Force to satisfy his drug habit, he would resort to petty crimes and armed robberies, even becoming a pimp. His new career was working. It satisfied his drug habits. 
but not for too long. Donald had conflict with a rival pimp who chased him from Flint, Michigan to Kansas City to Junction City. Throughout the commotion, Donald lost focus and got himself arrested. It was 1958, but going to prison provided a break from his heroin addiction. It gave Donald something he really needed, time for recovery. After three years in the can, he was released. Back in the Motor City, Donald was on the streets again. But this time he tested his abilities against the bigger heists. Along with three other men, he robbed a well-known numbers house, hoping to hit a big score. But their plans didn't work. One of the victims had a crying baby in the back room and asked Donald if she could attend to the baby. Donald obliged, not knowing the woman would call the police. This incident got Donald a year in federal prison. While there, Donald caught another year after the prison guards discovered that he was making illegal hooch for the general prison population. Donald was realizing his defiance was getting him into more and more trouble. He needed a change. Solitary confinement provided him a place to think and to write. Eventually, Donald would draft his first novel, a Western. He enjoyed watching Westerns in his youth, but it no longer hit the mark for Donald. He wanted to write stories on issues he was intimately familiar with, the life of street hustlers. For inspiration, he started to read the book, Pimp, The Story of My Life by Robert Beck, also known as Iceberg Slim. After Donald read that book, it changed his perspective on novels. He didn't know he could actually write stories like this for the world to read. Immediately, he started writing urban fiction with a passion. His first written novel was Whore Son, but his first published novel was Dope Fiend, The Story of a Black Junkie, which debuted in 1971, while the former in 1972. The books were so well received, Donald prolifically wrote many more novels, sometimes completing a book a month. His pace was so relentless the publisher suggested for Donald to assume a pseudonym to avoid having the sales of his other work suffer due to too many books releasing at once. Under the name of Al C. Clark, Donald started the Kenyatta series. The name was taken from the anti-colonial leader Mau Mau Revolutionary and Kenya's first president Jomo Kenyatta. In the series, the stories were about a pro-black nationalist group of vigilantes who fought to clean up the black community of drugs and crime. Highland Park, a city in Wayne County, roughly six miles from downtown Detroit. It has an interesting history of former founders, including one Detroit judge, the second, the son of another judge, hoping to establish a thriving community. Henry Ford purchased almost 200 acres with the plan to build an automotive factory, which was completed in 1909. Sixty plus years later, Donald would call Highland Park his home. It was the evening of October 21, 1974, on a Monday. Donald was actively typing on his typewriter, completing the finishing touches on another story, feeling invigorated with a renewed spirit for his career. It was not lost on Donald that he was one of the most popular black authors of his generation, and the money was starting to look good, but he had one goal he needed to accomplish. Writing stories was only one part of it. Turning those stories into movies was his ultimate goal, but he would have to go to Hollywood. But that goal was fatally aborted. According to police reports, while Donald was busy at his typewriter, his common law wife, Miss Shirley Saylor, was in the kitchen preparing popcorn. Their two kids were in the living room watching television. Suddenly, there was a loud knock at the front door. Donald got up to answer it. Moments later, a loud commotion ensued. Neighbors would later report hearing loud fussing and profanity. Eventually, there were gunshots fired. An anonymous call was made to police. When the police arrived, they found Donald shot dead on the living room floor. Shirley was shot dead and left in the kitchen. The two kids were left unharmed, crying. The only description provided to law enforcement indicated the two men were white. The investigation did not gather much steam and remains unsolved to this day. Speculation has been plenty. Some assume that Donald reneged on an outstanding drug debt. He either refused to pay or took too long to pay. Others believed his novels accurately told the stories of real-life people and real-life situations, excluding real-life names. But the real-life people may have wanted him dead anyway, 
No one knows the real reason. Homicide detectives assumed it was a professional hit. All the signs were there. No evidence. No leads. Nothing. Even the kids were left alone. Something to expect from a professional hit. At Donald's funeral, the mood was somber and sad as expected. He lived the way of his characters and also met his fate in similar circumstances. He was dressed in a dark suit, holding one of his books that was placed in the grip of his hand, but the book was later stolen. Rumor has it the book held a secret note inside, revealing the names of individuals who wanted him dead. However, this rumor has never been confirmed. We still don't know who killed Donald Goines and why, and we probably will never know. But one thing we are certain of, Donald Goines was a great storyteller, one of the best. We can only imagine what stories he would be telling today.